Now, the Police and Peace Officers Memorial actually concluded this morning in Ottawa just as we were beginning our service here in Smith Falls. And as they have done over the past 40 years, police and peace officers met on Parliament Hill to honor comrades who died in the line of duty and to honor their surviving families. In 1998, the federal government officially proclaimed the last Sunday of September as Police and Peace Officers National Memorial Day. This is a sign of respect for those who sacrifice to keep our community safe and our environment protected. In 1978, the first memorial honored 14 officers. In 2017, the names of over 870 members are engraved on the honor roll. This morning, we will remember our police and peace officers in prayer. We will also speak to the way that God's generous justice is consistent with initiatives in our own justice system, such as restorative justice. The people whom Jonah hated turned from their evil ways and God spared them the calamity that was planned. In response, Jonah cries out, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah hated the Ninevites. Jonah hated the people of Nineveh more than he loved life. Now, like all people who cherish vengeance more than they love life, Jonah had his reasons. A commonly postulated reason amongst religious folk was that Jonah was good and righteous. Jonah loved what God loved, and the Ninevites were unspeakably evil. Jonah hated the people of Nineveh because God hated them too. Now, Nineveh was Assyria's chief city and capital. We are told that the history of Assyria was filled with violence, terror, torture, and the killing of conquered peoples. Assyrians, we are told, carried home vanquished kings' bodies as trophies of war. The severed head of a recently conquered king was raised on a pole in the midst of a banquet commemorating victory, and finally it was put over the city gate. Opposing generals were flayed alive and their bodies divided into pieces, which were distributed over the country as a cautionary tale. These penalties were thought to discourage rebellion. Now, this kind of nastiness wasn't altogether alien or unique to Assyria. There are stories in our sacred texts in which it is difficult to judge between those who are declared righteous and those who are declared evil. The Assyrians, we are told, went a step farther and practice human sacrifice, including that of children. Now, there was another, and perhaps more important reason to Jonah that caused him to particularly hate Assyria and its capital city, Nineveh. Assyria would be responsible for dividing the northern and southern kingdom of Israel, a division from which Israel would never recover. In effect, Assyria destroyed the kingdom of Israel. 
this was the most evil of cities from the perspective of any Jew or Israelite. Assyria would be responsible for a successful genocide. Assyria, represented in her capital city, Nineveh, took away everything. If ever you hear a reference to the lost tribes of Israel, it was through the agency of Assyria that the tribes were lost. The story of Jonah, then, is the story of a man who was called of God to restore a people who would be guilty of genocide. A people who would erase Jonah's home, his identity, his history, and his culture. Jonah's people would cease to be. Better to die than to see Nineveh spared. O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. It makes Jonah, those who tell Jonah's story, and those who hear Jonah's story, sick to death to see Nineveh get away, not only with its violence, but to be spared when it would be the kingdom that erased the people who were the custodians of God's promise. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. And Jonah responds, And now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Seeing Nineveh as unredeemable was the only comfort Jonah had. Leaving them to pay for their transgressions meant that he could rest. Seeing them destroyed would mean that Jonah's work was done. Jonah was comfortably sitting by the gallows, waiting for a gruesome form of closure. There is finality in punitive justice. It is here, however, standing or sitting by the gallows, that Jonah sees that God's justice is restorative. Now, restorative justice is not unique to the story of Jonah. It's endorsed by many faith communities. As it is coming to be practiced today, its roots can be found in Aboriginal healing traditions. Restorative justice operates in the premise that conflict, even criminal conflict, inflicts harm. And therefore, individuals must accept responsibility for repairing that harm. Communities are empowered to choose their response to conflict. Victims, offenders, and communities actively participate in devising mutually beneficial solutions and implementing those solutions. Conflicts are resolved in a way that restores harmony in relationships and allows people to continue to live together in a safer healthier community. The Aboriginal concept of circle remedies has become an integral part of progressive programming in the federal justice system. A system of justice that has at its core practices of healing and remedy, remedy rather than revenge is therapeutic and restorative for all, not just perpetrators of wrong. The last Sunday of September of every year is Police and Peace Officers National Memorial Day in Canada. Police and Peace Officers 
lay down their lives. Sometimes in whole, and these are the people remembered this morning, but always in part. Exposure to trauma and the deep struggles of humanity has an effect that leaves many police and peace officers a little less alive. The victories achieved through restorative justice may help reconcile and redeem some of that ongoing sacrifice. This morning, Trinity United Church offers her support and prayers to those who have accepted the call to do the difficult work and sacrifice remembered at the Police and Peace Officers Memorial and that sacrifice that is given every day. We also celebrate with you the ongoing work of restorative justice. Sacrifice and redemption are themes that we share in common. And Rob. Thank you, Christopher. Constable Aaron Tompkins is the Smith Falls Police Community Service Officer, or CSO. The goal of our CSO is to strive to further the Smith Falls Police Service model of community first, and as such is an integral part in providing top-notch community policing. We have invited him to speak this morning. And if I may just say that there are three of us here in the congregation this morning, Barry Maplebeck, Lorraine Allen, and myself, who are on the Smith Falls Municipal Drug Strategy Committee, and we work very, very closely with Aaron, and we hope that we can have a, a number of more years on the committee. Now I'd like to introduce Aaron Tompkins. Can everybody hear me okay? Perfect. So when I came this morning, I wasn't too sure about uh, how many people I had recognized, so I was glad to see I recognized about three quarters of y'all in here, which is awesome. Uh, and truth behold, um, a neighbor of mine, Walter, uh, and I were chatting last week about his new car. So if anybody uh, hasn't had a chance to see it, it's a beautiful car for his wife. Um, so he made a deal with me, you come and speak at my church, and he'll let me use his car for the day. So that was a pretty good deal. Thanks, Walter. Uh, again, on behalf of Smith Falls Police Service um, and myself, that's why I'm here today. We've come together for uh, kind of two separate um, issues or purposes. So first being uh, a lot of the nice words about the uh, police and Peace Officer Memorial. So that one's dear and dear to our hearts, um, and we appreciate all the nice uh, prayers, concerns that you uh, that you guys have for us. Policing isn't an easy job by any means. Um, every day, just like any job, has its ups and downs. It's not uh, everything you see on television. You don't get five minutes of excitement, um, or that's not the whole shift. There's maybe two or three minutes of exciting things. And then the rest of it, you're either uh, helping someone or you're doing paperwork and all that stuff. So again, uh, it, it does have its, its ups and downs. And the biggest part with policing that we're finding nowadays is um, one quick decision that you might have to make. So just in picture yourself, you have to make a decision just like that. And it could be life or death of you or someone else. So in that moment, you just have that one second, but afterwards you have hundreds, thousands of people, now with social media, millions of people judging your actions. So that's, that's what we're dealing with every day. So it, it does, have its, does have its challenges or has its challenges. Um, and like Christopher said, there's, um, since it started in 1978, I've been to a few of the memorials and they're, uh, they're done in Ottawa. 
and there's a, a nice, beautiful memorial there. If anybody has a chance to go see it, please do. But over uh, 850, so I think we're up to almost 870. So that's a lot. So if you do the math, that is a lot every year. That um, frontline first responders, peace officers, police officers um, are sacrificing to their communities, just like Snow Falls here, if you would. Um, secondary to that, um, Christopher and I had a discussion. Uh, we went to coffee culture, had a nice cup of coffee, uh, had a great discussion. Um, he reached out and said, let's talk about some restorative justice. Let's tie this in with our, uh, with our Sunday Mass. So I said, you know what, this is a great program. And it's, it's not a new program by any means. Um, indigenous people, natives people, they've been doing it for hundreds, thousands of years. So traditionally, if they're having issues with, uh, it doesn't matter if that person is specifically in trouble, but if somebody's having issues in their community, they would sit down, the elders, the chief, and they would form almost a committee of people to figure out what's going on with this person in our community, how do they need help, and then how can we help them? So, how it ties into policing is, and again, this is something that we always do or have done in our communities. Since I've been here 14 years and I've been active in quite a few of them. Uh, typically with youth under 18 years old, so we look for alternative measures rather than just send them through our court system and hope for the best um, at 14 or 15 years old. The teenage brain doesn't uh, think and make decisions as adults do. So with that, we're trying to correct their wrongs and uh, this is one way that we go about it. So with reference to uh, restorative justice, I'll just read out just the, the basic definition of it. So it's restorative justice views crime as more than breaking the law. It also causes harm to people, relationships and its community. So a just response must address those harms as well as the wrongdoing that that person has done. If the parties are willing, the best way to do this is to help them meet to discuss those harms and how about bringing a resolution to that situation. Other approaches are available if they are unable to or unwilling to meet. Um, sometimes those meetings lead to a transformational changes in that young person's life. So let's say if we're dealing with a person, he's stolen a chocolate bar or stolen money from mom or dad, and instead of charging that person, we'll often um, bring the almost formulate a team, community team, and we often meet in churches, to be honest, which is kind of ironic, but we all, all often do it in, like downstairs in the churches, and we'll have whoever would be affected. So let's say the victim, so let's say in this case, uh, a rock was thrown through one of the beautiful stained glass windows. Um, we would bring that young person in, we would probably have Christopher sit in, maybe a couple other of the um, members of the church, we would have somebody from a community justice, justice uh, come in and sit. I would sit, often the parents of the, uh, of the young person as well. So anybody that we think that would be affected. Um, and what we basically do is sit down in a circle. So it's not one person just being directed and spoken to. You don't do this again, because that doesn't work for kids. They need to understand why and how this impacted. So let's say in this case, this church, so Christopher could say, this stained glass window's been in here for 80 years. And it's beautiful, the, the person did it themselves, and just explain a little bit of the history of why and if, of its importance. Um, and often what this does, and then we go around the circle, and I would say, this is how this has impacted me. By you throwing a rock or whatever through the window and breaking it, this is how it's impacted me. Now I can't help somebody else that may need help, um, I mean, this is all part of my job, however, there could be somebody that needs my help more than a rock thrown through a window at this time. And often what we'll do, if everybody is uh, on, in agreement to the outcome, we come up with, uh, it's not really a punishment, it's more of an educational piece for that young person. And it was, it's going to be overseen by members in this committee that we formed, and it may be as simple as Pardon me? Oh. Maybe as simple as um, coming and doing some cleaning at the church. If that person, obviously, I don't know how much a window like that, probably irreplaceable and lots of time and money to replace. Um, 
that young person or the family may not have the means to fix it, so they could do other things. They could come, they could volunteer at the church, they could come and clean up, they cut the grass, and that would be not a punishment, but just acknowledgement that that person did do something wrong and that, that they've learned from it. So again, restorative justice, it, it's one way, it's not a, a punishment, it's more of an education and it's an impact on how this one action affected now seven or eight different people, plus let's say everybody in the community uh, or in the, sorry, in the church, plus anybody driving by seeing that, oh wow, that window was smashed out. So it just, one simple action doesn't affect one person, it can affect thousands of people. And that's, that's kind of the point we try to get across to these young people. And then also we all provide uh, some mentorship along the way. So why did you do this? Um, we, we find out maybe it was just he was being pressured by someone. So we talk about that. There's some educational on maybe how you could do things differently. So with young people especially, that's, um, that's kind of the course that we try and take. Because um, courts, through the, the court system, isn't uh, a place for... For most youth, there is a there is a place for them, but most youth, they need to learn uh, in different ways and how it impacts people. So I do appreciate you guys today, and uh, like I said, I know a lot of people here already, so it was pretty easy. I'm not nervous at all, which is great. Um, and by all means, if if you want me back to speak on anything else, I'd be more than happy to. Um, I work Monday to Fridays, eight to four. That's my uh, scheduled shifts, and uh, it's Aaron Tompkins. We're at Seven Hershey Drive, and I just want to say thank you. On behalf of the Smith Falls Police Service, um, my administrators, my coworkers, for your thoughts and prayers on today for the uh, memorial, as well as just allowing me to come and speak to you, uh, your congregation. So I do appreciate it, and thank, thank you very much, folks. Thank you. Yeah.